and you need two one for, one for your guest if especially for every big get mm -hmm. right so you get a big get the um you send one to him and you put one on that wall right behind you that i'm looking at right and pretty soon you explain that you know each the, the gold ones represent you know any podcast downloaded over a thousand or fifteen hundred times and the silver represents something else mm -hmm. and they see a wall of that behind you it does all the speaking for you that you need mm -hmm. right people come into your office they don't need that anymore Right? right and what happens is people when they get that in the mail so i sent this to scott haynes scott haynes is so reclusive it's insane i, I mean, talked to him he doesn't come out yes. but when he got this he was like first thing i wanted to do was put it on my wall and he went out to go get a hammer and nail because he doesn't have anything on his wall he says first thing i want to do is take a picture and show everybody you know and so um, I had all these other different ideas of what you could do with this, you know, the whole concept to make to make money and stuff. But I really just put it together to make it to thank everybody yeah. for it. And so, you know, I made these commemorative CDs. And what will happen is, let's suppose you you make one of these, and it's mine. And you may or you know, and I I'm going to go on Facebook and show everybody. Check this out, and you know, it's going to be. And then you'll see it in the background when I do videos. Yeah. <laughs> So it's yes. actually it's a very cool concept and and there's a lot you can do with it for branding and authority. And even if let's suppose that you did these as awards and you nominated somebody for your best bot podcast, right? Now what's going to happen is when you send out the nominations and that's a really fancy type of invitation or whatever it is, you can then get they and they want one of these awards, they'll tell the people, hey, can you go vote for me? And so they have to go and join, you know, right. inspired <laughs> to vote for you. And so you start collecting names a lot. Very smart. <laughs> yeah. So the, actually, one of the things that I'm very good at, and without trying to pat myself on the back too much or sound egotistical, is I've studied, I know the concepts of marketing so ingrained because, like, while my dad started studying co copywriting at the age of 30, I started at nine. Right. <laughs> In you the know, womb, you were probably absorbed by absorbing by osmosis, right? Well, actually, my mom and my dad are both pretty smart. My mom made a lot of the breakthroughs for Halberts Incorporated, um, but and we were stuffing and stamping and sealing envelopes as children. But I didn't really get plucked out and told, "Hey, I'm teaching you marketing." Until that day, I think I told you, you know, my dad. I told him this was great and I could learn how he got rich and he was like that's it and he started taking me everywhere with him so I was really you know even of my my dad's kids I was the only one who was being dragged for business meetings all over the country in the Cayman Islands and things like that yeah so tell me um, the we website start the interview. <laughs> I actually I actually started okay. recording so oh. if we can include <laughs> this I'm gonna include it okay okay I'm gonna give you a formal introduction but I have to follow up first just Tell, tell people where they can find because that's the audio series. Just tell people where they can find that those uh, those interviews or okay. and the letters. There are first you can go to the GaryHalbertLetter.com dot com and mm -hmm. you'll see something right up there at the top. Yeah. But you can also we got the, a lot of people didn't notice some of the cool things that we did in this launch because they just got went nuts for the product and went straight to, towards it and they skipped the copy and everything. It's available on iTunes and through iTunes Music Spoken Word. Very few marketers are actually charging for content and through iTunes and getting it. But that makes it easy for you to, you know, if you're an iTunes user, pop it on and listen to it in your car or wherever. Everybody's yeah. so used to I that. I saw system. that. There's like an iTunes 1 and 2, right? Yeah. Well, we couldn't put them all into the 1. So what we did was we took – these were all the first batches we wanted to do. So if you look closely – in the names, we just broke it, you know, that's batch one or Got that's it. batch two. Yeah. And th so you can see that at iTunes or you can get the Android version straight from our site at yeah. thegaryhalbertletter.com. How do you decide what to charge for that? Um, actually, it's kind of, you kind of test it out or feel what you, what's right. And we have different goals with it. See, the ongoing thing that I wanted to do here with the product is I want to turn it into sort of... Um, one of those everlasting resources that you go to, like when people say, how do I learn copywriting? Go to the Gary Halbert letter is one thing that a lot of people tell tell yeah. people to do. Yeah. This is really, as Brian McLeod likes to say, the new way to really experience the Gary Halbert letter. Because not only do, you know, I learned this when I published the Boron letters. This book is available for free for decades, right, online, still is. But people wanted to get it in the format where they could get it on the go and read it on planes and stuff like that. And the other thing is they really liked me updating it and explaining how this concept is still applicable today. Right. And, and some of the comments I've gotten back were like, you know, I really didn't get the value of that until I read your thing. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. It clicked for me. 
And so one of the things I've always been able to do is take my dad's concepts or the teachings and apply them in a fundamental way. So, for example, um, you know, in his book, he has this chapter, which is ridiculously, sounds ridiculously out of date. It's on 900 numbers, which were the less pornographic 976 numbers that people could call up and deliver, you know. Right. And so he was explaining how when people would pay small bits of information that they could get automatically without having to face somebody, and you could capture names and addresses, but you could just make money off that, like, you know, call for your horoscope. There's a lot of people who thought, well, you know, this is old Jurassic technology. It's worthless. Well, what if you can apply that to SMS texting. You know, the four-digit codes that you do to right. you know, text yeah, yeah, four-digit yeah. codes to donate money or to get your horoscope or whatever it is. You know, every single thing in that chapter translates right to that. And if you don't see that, if you don't make the connection, and that's one of the things in the, some of the questions that you had, uh, you know, sent that you think that we might talk about is if you don't tell people <laughs> you know how to uh, convert and translate these lessons a lot of times they don't figure it out and the system are, are not the system the audio series what it does though is when you hear one of these other great marketing legends talk to you about how it changed their life or the way they viewed it it changes your entire perspective on the yeah. letter that you've already read three or four times yeah. so, so much it, like heightens the value yeah yeah, and you know, so what we did was we threw in for people who were longtime fans. We threw in unposted letters. They did, they don't, and they again they skipped right over the copy, went right to buying it, and they didn't notice that Scott Haynes's track is actually an unposted letter. You know, so that makes it worth the price of the whole series. Mm -hmm. all. So in any case, we wanted to continue with the tradition of making it affordable to anybody who really wants to be interested in it. Right. And so when you go on iTunes, there's a certain amount that you have to do. And there's a certain amount, if you make it free, that you are cheap and cheapening it. People do not value things that are free. Yeah. You could give somebody the exact same information for free and give it to somebody who charges you $10,000 for it. And the guy who char paid $10,000 is going to follow up. Make right. sure that you told them something that worked. And yeah. you know he or she is going to put stuff into action when they've invested effort and money and stuff like that. They're more likely to. Yeah. So we needed to charge something, but we needed to also keep with the family tradition of making sure it's, you know, um, not that it's affordable. And then the other thing that is important for marketers nowadays is you have to charge based on what that media will actually allow. Right. There are exceptions. I don't believe in absolutes at all. You know, there are thousand dollar apps when you want to download the legal law, you know, right. the legal. Not common, but stuff. yeah. Right. Yeah, they're not common and everything. But there's a certain point for which things are a no brainer. You know, everybody, you know, for a song, everybody's like, you know, 99 cents or $1.39. That's yeah. the no brainer price. Yeah. An ebook, you know, people don't even think when it's nine, nine, nine bucks on Amazon. They, any other price, they think about it. If it's cheaper, they even wonder why is it cheaper. <laughs> right. Nine dollars is the no thinking price, and so that was also played a part in the role in in doing the pricing. Most people actually came to us and gave us the reaction we want, which is why in the world are you selling this so cheap? Professionals right. told us why are right. you selling this so cheap? Yeah. And the other the other part is it's a, it's this isn't about us. It's about exposing the letter to a new generation. Of people and in a new method that people can you know and revitalize it for people who had it before because the one thing about my dad's teachings is if you, when you listen to people's top ten books lists or the things that um, that they go over my dad's are the ones that they go over and over again and keep getting new stuff out right. like his boron letters I know so many people who read them once to twice yeah. a year. And they handwrite them. Not only read them, but a lot of the copywriters yeah. I talk to, they just handwrite all of them. Yeah. Yes. And the, and you know, that is a you know, so what one of the things that my brother and I try to do is we don't change our dad's stuff. If we augment it, you know, we'll add to it, you know, at the end, leave it as as much as we can in the original format. But we don't want you to lose sight of it. You know, we don't you know, at the beginning I gotta tell you, there's an update to this nine hundred number lesson, right? right? Um, just to get you there. But I leave his stuff as much as we can alone. And then we try and enhance it. So, for example, we did an ad breakdown of the most widely mailed sales letter in history that my dad wrote called the Coat of Arms letter. Okay, And it sold family coats of arms. In fact, you can see one over my shoulder in the background there. That's actually – if your family ever bought one of those, my dad started the whole industry in the 1970s right, or late 60s. And um, the uh, – 
forget where I was going with that. The uh... <laughs> you're saying the coat of arms letter. Oh, we, oh, so sorry. We're breaking down the coat of arms letter. And my dad explained that there's 18 months of hard work and hidden psychology put into that one page letter. We go in there and we break it down like word by word, explain it. We don't change it. We explain what it right. is, why he did this. And we explain stuff no copywriters ever picked up on. You know, and because the copywriting, a lot of people didn't know where it started. And it actually started with the return address. My father would go out and he made, you know, this, this whole letter for its continuity of the, of the promotion had to sound and feel like it was coming from, uh, you know, a mid, Midwestern housewife. So they had to find uh, an address that had a street that didn't have a boulevard on it, right? And they didn't want to have a large number. But even when it came down to the address, they hand wrote out street. And every word of this letter has been tested, right? And they hand wrote out street and a lot. Nobody could figure out why they did this for many years. And I finally told everybody, look, when you get some mail that's from somebody that's handwritten out street, who is it? It's like a grandmother or some lady at home that has a lot more time and doesn't send a lot of letters. Every time somebody sends a lot of letters, they start abbreviating ST period, hmm, right? Interesting, right? Yeah. There's that level of psychology in the masterpieces, and a lot of people don't won't pick up on that. And like I said, they, it has to, you know they starts to explain it, and this goes back to what you're saying. We put that out there, and then somebody else masterfully picked up, and they said, you know, I have been handwriting out Gary Halbert letters and, and sales pieces and stuff, but the great thing about this one is I handwrite it out, and I listen to the breakdown you guys do, and I know exactly why I'm writing this word now, you know, and yeah. so it gives a total a different dimension. Oh, for sure. Well, the audio series does that because these guys are adding commentaries that are adding stories about my father, or they yeah. are... Um, adding lessons and tutorials in my ver in my particular piece, I my dad mentions there's seven there's hidden lessons in this piece that he's not mm. going to cover. I actually point out and cover seven of them. <laughs> so it's it's adding and giving a new dimension to it without tainting or tarnishing the original. So Bond, what's your favorite story from the All Star Audio series that you that someone told about your dad that you didn't know? Oh well, they, that's that's not a fair question to them because there's hardly any questions, uh, you know, stories about my dad that I didn't know, and the reason was is I was, you know, I I'm more than just his son. I was his, also his partner at one time, and we were close confidence and confidants and stuff like that. Um, so I wasn't shocked by that. I think the most interesting stories were actually my interactions with them themselves. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, I think I mentioned this before. My first my favorite interaction was actually, well, I shouldn't say favorite because, you know, getting Ben Zavinga to send one in, I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, this is amazing. He's come out of retirement for it and stuff like that. But I think it was uh, uh, the very first one. It was um, Joe Sugarman. And the reason for that was I've known about Joe and I met Joe back in the early 70s. I had one of the very first Batman credit cards that, you know, he. I have one of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I had, I had them from, we got them in the 70s. And my dad, he's always been really highly spoken of around the Halbert table. Mm. So every time I hear or talk to him or I'm in the room with him, and I've met him several times. I still get a little, you know, feel a little like, oh, that's a legend. I guess the way that people would feel being near my dad, you know. And so I went to go, um, I, I, one day I just got up and said, you know, I got to do this series. And so who should I call? And I went through my, just my phone book and my card book. And I'm like, who do I got in here and who would be a really big get? And I saw Joe Sugarman's name. I'm like, I got to call him. Right. So I call him up and he picks up the phone. I, you know, and I'm expecting to go through, you know, three secretaries, gate, gatekeepers, yeah. you know, as I, oh, as I joked about, you know, fill out of a, a phone request in triplicate, you know, <laughs> but he picks up the phone. He's like, hey, you know, I'm like, hey, Joe. He's like, yeah, and I, you know, he reminded him who I was. He knew me right away and all that, you know, it just all comes flooding back. He said yes right away. So I took a page out of my dad's book and I packaged this all up and I took a FedEx envelope and I addressed it to him. I put in a pre paid pre-addressed FedEx return envelope for myself there, except I, not FedEx, I made it UPS so that he could just put it in his own mailbox or drop it on his own stoop. 
put in a recorder with fresh batteries. I put in the letter. I went through the whole process myself so that I could tell him to make the instructions simple so he wouldn't frustrate himself. So I said, you know, turn off all the noise in the thing uh, in your backgrounds, get yourself some water, mm -hmm. read it three times aloud. You know, when you make a flub something, just say, scratch that, we'll erase it, just start rereading that sentence from the beginning again. You know, all these kinds of detailed things to make it super simple, super right. easy, super clear. I send it off to him. I get the thing back so fast. I'm like, no way. He, you know, the, I'm like, he didn't do it. You know, he's, he's, you know, this, I'm getting the recorder back saying, sorry, this is going to take too much of my time. I open it up and I turn on the recorder and I hear the legendary Joe Sugarman reading an issue of the Gary Halbert letter that mentions him actually. Oh, I guess here's a shocking, <laughs> one of the shocking things that happened. And I'm like, no way. This is, did he, well, anyway, so I, I'm listening. I'm like, okay, did he do the whole thing? He did the whole thing. I'm like, wait, did he add commentary? He added commentary. And the commentary he added, he actually disagreed with something my dad said in the letter. <laughs> <laughs> and this was fantastic. You know, most of the time you're expecting everybody to come in and honor and all this. Right. Joe Sugarman's like, no, I'm this part. I think he's wrong. And I, my test showed this thing, you know. And the great part about that is, you know, when we share that with the world, they see how raw it is. They see how right. that everybody's just like Gary, that they're, you know, that these guys chosen were not just chosen for their name recognition. They're, you know, there's people in there people don't recognize. Well, once they hear their commentary, they're like, oh my God, you know, where, you know, how come I haven't heard of this person? But anyway, so he sends it back that quick. And then I'm like, now I'm worried about losing this file. I race home to copy right. it on different disks and thumb drives and all this other stuff. And so it was. That was the. That was, I think, the funniest experience and the most I shocking like thing in the commentary was him disagreeing with my dad. The very first one. I'm like, is everybody going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> but it was just one point. And again, you know, he's always going to hold a certain spot. You know, you know, he's always been held a certain spot in my heart. Anyway. And even though I know this guy and I've known him very, you know, for a long time, but the fact that he did this so quickly, so cleanly, it actually made me th rethink about the way that I operate too, which is, you know, the guys who are at the top of the industry, they're very easy to work with. They're like, hey, you know, what do you want? This is what I want. This is what I need. You know, and you want to do this idea? Sure. Sounds great. Let's do it. Send it over. Do it. Bop, bop, bop. And everything's done. <laughs> you know, it is not, you know. Uh, well, let's you know. There's there's not a lot of negotiations and discussions about with lawyers, and there's not a lot of you know hemming and hawing, and they really just push right through it and get it done. And the the quick you know the way that he was the other thing that was great about it was he was approachable. You know that was one He's thing. He's extremely people find. approachable. Yeah. Yeah. Such I mean, a nice guy. Just I, I can't say enough good things about Joe Shinerman. <laughs> but what did he disagree with? I'm going to let people who get the, get the series to find out about that one. I have to ask, though, of course. No, uh, I, I, I understand you're asking. Yeah. <laughs> I just got to leave a little curiosity um, hanging there. So, Bon, I'm going to give you a formal introduction right now. This is the <laughs> longest pre-session chat I've had before breaking into an intro. But um, let's do it. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And today we have Bond Halbert, who's one of the legends of copywriting. His father is the late Gary Halbert, and who's loved and looked up to by many as one of the best copywriters of all time. Bond is carrying on the tradition. He is very well known for his email marketing skills, and he's gonna talk about one specific example where he got a 52% open rate to a dead list, we'll talk, and how he taught his daughter to do this, and she gets a 40% open rate, and he helps copywriters with their spin and their hook. Bond, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so I always like to include a fun fact. Fun fact maybe most people don't know about you because you put a lot of information out on the, on the web. There's a professional fun fact and a personal fun fact. Professionally, which I thought was interesting, you listen to really loud music when you're working. Yeah. Um, Why? I, I just, you know, I listened to music when I was a kid doing homework. So I got used to reading and writing with music and beats going on. And I do not, the one thing that is actually even more extremely odd is I don't listen to a particular type of music. My, my range is very eclectic. I will have Panic at the Disco come on right after Vivaldi and it's on shuffle. So I'm not even paying attention to any of that. And I know, and I don't even get distracted or taken away by the music it just for some reason it's focusing in and doing that out I also 
The other thing is, I a lot of people talk about working anywhere in the world that they are. I work outdoors more than anybody I know, too, as far as literally writing, sitting down and writing, doing stuff outdoors as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a habit I think I picked up from, you know, from school. And I did that a lot in college, too. So I think the, um, I think the, uh, I think it's a, it's a strange thing because, you know, some writers will say, yes, I put on Mozart and it gets the flow going. Or, right. you know, one of the things I like is listening to soundtracks of movies. So I will get like the Born Identity soundtrack and put it on because, you know, it makes even laundry. You know, when you put on spy soundtrack music, it makes even laundry exciting. Like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's one thing I do that most of the most other writers don't. And personally, this was really interesting. What is your personal fun fact that most people don't know? You have a degree on the wall there. Tell yep. me about the other fun fact about you. I have a degree in international business administration with a minor in economics. Uh, it's actually part of the marketing department degree. It's a five-year degree. But I don't have a high school diploma, a GED, or anything that's equivalent to that. I don't even have a high school equivalency. <laughs> And the reason was I got kicked out of high school for poor behavior. And yeah, I, was, I was actually kicked out. I was getting very good grades. But I was being kicked out for, you know, ditching and fighting and, you know, just, just not being a team player. And it was basically because I was bored out of my mind. Um, and I really was. I remember being in middle school. They tried to, you know, I remember, uh, this is a long story that I'll make real short. I was in sixth grade and I had these teachers that, uh, or we had this one friend who was an actor. So he got out, he had to be out a lot. So he had everybody's homework, the whole homework for the year and could do it in advance. Well, he had it during summer months. And we said, oh, wait a minute, let's see what the thing is. We went and did it all. And we taught ourselves math, right, for that thing and just followed it through, did the whole thing. So we're sitting there talking, thinking that we're going to be able to talk now during math class. And the teacher's like, wait a minute, what are you doing? And we said, no, here's the homework. Here's all your stuff. They're like, you did it already? So what they did was they took us out, put us in our own separate room, and gave us a new math test. I mean, a new a level of math. Just these group of people. Well, nobody had done that for the sixth graders in the LAUSD before. So when we got into seventh grade, they wouldn't put me in the same class with my brother because I knew the math because they said, no, you, you know, no sixth grader knows pre-algebra. I'm like, no, I do. And that lady would shoot me questions to try and embarrass me. And I would answer them correctly. And then she'd say later, she'd say, look, I know you obviously know this. I can't move you into the other class. Just do your homework in here from your other classes. And high school was like that. It was a repetitive thing, you know. And so I quickly, um, I got, got bored so fast that, you know, I was just, you know, I was young teenage kid who was bored and got, became a troublemaker more than anything else. But I was still a very articulate kid and I was, you know, nobody understood the education I was really getting from my father right. anyway. <laughs> right. And so it was, it was pretty wild. And then I found out I could just, you know, I was planning on going to community college for the first two years anyway, just to, be, just to save money. And you don't need the degree to get in there. So I just went in there, got good grades there, transferred over. And I specifically, when I even, um, they give me, an, I got an associate arts. I had to go and transfer paperwork. And they're like, you know, you've got all the credits. You want this. But I specifically avoided getting a GED <laughs> and all this. Because afterwards, I got my degree. I have a five-year college degree from a university. And I was so, you know, I was so proud of always being the exception to the rule. That I, you know, I, I obviously could go and pass a GED test in a heartbeat if I needed to, <laughs> but I actually kind of like the fact that I don't have a high school diploma yet. <laughs> I'm I like that. Very successful in my field, and I even have a college degree, and you know, and I make other people who have, you know, there are other people with higher degrees that than I did, than I have who come to listen to me and to my ideas and stuff like that because it's not really it's your you know the experience I gained growing up was a lot greater than most of the stuff most of the school business school teachings yeah that they gave. so bon tell me about some of the memorable because you talk about exception to the we were the exception of the rule and so a lot of times you were brought into different masterminds and things what are some of the experiences you think of when you were growing up from with your dad well the one thing I was talking with um, one of my dad's good friends from way back in the day who was there for it. And we were talking about it because he's, you know, he was telling me, because he was saying, you know, you were different though, because I always looked at this as my dad's parenting skill being different. Um, 
you know, um, and I'll make this short because I've said it to so many people so many times, Because, it, but it's basically how I started. When I walked down the street and told my dad that seeing him in the down uh, spot was great because I could see how he climbed out and became rich again, yeah. he decided then that I would be, you know, he would start mentoring right. me. And so he started singling me out and taking me and flying me all over the country and going to different places. And so I grew up knowing, you know, I remember one time he took me out of school just to go and attend a brainstorming session with Jay Abraham and Eric Weinstein. And I remember flying flying back to Ohio to hang out with Ben Suarez and those guys and, you know, Cayman Islands and all of that kind of stuff. But he would, you know, he, the, but the cool thing about it was the way that he handled it. He would tell me on the way, this is what I'm going to go and try and do and accomplish. And I would be in the meeting. And on the way home, I would say, I would hear the recap. Okay, this is what he said. This is what he's really going to do. This is what she, you know, this is what she's going to, uh, her part in this, and this is how she's going to do it and why she'll follow through or why, you know, and he would do an after action assessment as well. So I got to know how he planned. I got to see the execution and I got to see the, the process of turning you know, I don't want to call it failures, but turning any, you know, disappointments into learning experiences and to, you know, understanding the whole process all the way through. Yeah. And so I was privy not just to the meetings, but to his entire the thought, whole thought process. process. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, my dad mentioned, well, has mentioned many times to many people that nobody on earth thinks more like him than I do. In fact, one of my proudest moments was somebody had, you know, I spent my youth hearing people say, Gary, how am I going to market this or what should my spin, spin be? And I'd be sitting there doing something thinking, okay, he's going to say dollar bill letter and this is going to be the headline. Mm -hmm. And eventually I became the best in the world at predicting what he was going to say. <laughs> right? right. And my biggest, you know, thing was uh, my brother actually gave him a product that was very unique and set of circumstances and he, he swore me to secrecy and because he wanted different different opinions from me and other people and so I called my dad one time and I said hey what are you doing he said I'm working on an ad for your brother and I go oh really he told you about his product project and he says yeah and I said what did he tell you to do or what did you tell him to do and it's very rare that my dad does this he said I told him to give it away and I said that's funny that's the exact same thing I told him to do you wow. know and that and it wasn't that I you know I mean it was just one of the for, you know the key to when you give away a product is simple it's, you know, when you've got a 90% plus reorder rate, right? <laughs> but it was the fact that that wasn't one of the standard, as, you know, Carlton calls it the 20 clicks, the standard 20 answers that Gary gave. And the fact that I could pick up on that and, you know, and I wasn't even thinking about my dad, that whole, that made me go, okay, I think I, I that's when I said, yeah, I really think a lot like him. <laughs> yeah. But I want to go back to when you were young and you made that, you were walking with your dad, you made that statement to him. Mm -hmm. what, what made you, and that's pretty privy for a, uh, for a young kid to make that statement when your dad's down the dumps to just tell him, I want to see you when you're, you know, when you make your money. What made you say that at that time? I, it, I honestly felt it. Well, you know, my dad, this was around the age when you, you, there's a certain age where you get a recognition of who your father is. You're like, you know, my daughter right now, you know, she will tell her friends things and they get, you know, um, she hates to admit it sometimes that I'm as cool as she is <laughs> because they will go to her, her, she will tell her friends, yeah, I was listening to uh, Panic of the Disco was one of the bands actually, but uh, My Chemical Romance or something. And she goes to her friends, she goes, yeah, I got it because my dad had it. And they're like, your dad has that? <laughs> and then they hear about what my name is and stuff. And so they, they, she already has this idea of me being more of a unique character than a lot of the other other fathers, mm -hmm. right? This was a time and period where I started realizing, you know, how my dad was different from everybody else. He made more money than other people. He thought differently. He had independence and freedom and everybody envied him, right? And, and everybody envied his money making skills and so forth. So I had this, you know, concept of where what he was. And so he, I had seen him doing the up and down thing. And my oldest brother, who, um, you know, got to play with all the, you know, all the toys. My dad had the 1955 Thunderbird belonged to the Smothers Brothers. We lived at a big beach house in, out on PCH, which I hated, but my brother loved, you know, because he was the right age. He had all these toys, and that was part of the conversation. I said, you know, I'm lucky because while they get to play with all this stuff, uh, which is going to be going away, I'm sure, <laughs> um, I get to see how you do this. So I get to learn the business. 
And, you know, it was just one of the things that, that one of the things I'm very fortunate for is very early on, I came from a family that is not all alike. We're not all into sports. We don't all hate sports. We're not all into money, uh, being an entrepreneur, but we all don't hate it. Um, and so one of the things I was very early to, to recognize was actually my own fallibility and the fact that I could be a lot like a lot of people. And so I started to learn from other people's mistakes. And this was like one of those first examples where I was like, okay, I'm going to learn from following in your footsteps as well as learning from mistakes. And I did do a very good job of it. My dad has a letter, which is in the series, but you can also check it out on his site for free, um, called The Dark Side of Success. And in it, he talks about making a lot of money early in life, losing friendships because of it, and you know, uh, home invasion robbery, in which I was upstairs sleeping when it happened. Really? I remember waking up to it, yep. Going to prison, I was there for every single step of the way that that, that whole deal went down and all this. But when it came my time, and all of this stuff eerily kind of happened at the same time, I was targeted to be kidnapped and killed by the Russian mob, <laughs> literally, <laughs> here in L.A. When it came down to me being targeted by federal investigators and stuff like that, I beat out, I beat everybody. I, you know, I got, because I learned from my dad's mistakes, right? And the that was been one key advantage for me going on is because I'm. You know, one of your questions is about mentors. You yeah. know, like, who are your mentors? I don't do things like that in that way because, you know, Gary Halber was the, is a guy who I never want to learn boating skills from. <laughs> but, you know, you want to learn you how know, to You know, Scott write. Haynes told me a story regarding that, so that's why I laugh. So, Oh, I'm sure. If, like, if you were my dad's friend, you have a story about going boating with him or you went to a movie with him. It was like <laughs> boating... And almost dying, it like kind of went together with that with with this story. Oh, you have no idea. What, what, and I've been dealing with it since I was a kid. And we're not talking, we're not even talking dozens. We're talking more than dozens of experiences. I mean, I remember one time I was sleeping in the boat in the in the, in the V berth of the boat. My dad's cruising up top with some girl, and I look up and there's smoke coming from the engine department uh, compartment. And I go, hey, the boat's on fire, and I rush out there. My dad cuts the engine, you know, does it, it cuts the engine, jumps overboard. <laughs> he's like, jump, Bon, jump. I'm like, no. Yeah, and I, he was very proud of this because I say, you know, you can get another woman. You can't get another sea hunt. This is a very special boat to me. <laughs> so I threw open the the hatch and you know just started spraying it out with the uh, you know the the uh, fire extinguisher, and then limped it home on one engine. And, but I can't tell you how many times I had to learn how to mechanics or fix the boat or, you know, John Carlton, I got stories with John Carlton about almost getting knocked unconscious by the boat, you know, coming down as you're trying to cut off the rope from a lobster trap my dad ran over with the props or, I mean, the, the stories are endless, you know, a drunken midnight, uh, you know, races to Bimini in his boat, you know, oh my uh, God. anyway, but the, the point that going back to the point I'm trying to make. I believe you can learn from anybody and everybody, and I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't have an exclusion. I don't look at somebody and say well, your life sucks. You're down in the dumps. You don't have any money. You don't have any prospects, and think they have nothing of value. You right. know, um, and there. What I learned to do is I learned to um, go to certain people. They're my mentor for a certain thing, for right. a certain activity. So, for example, you know, if um, I want a technical question answer, I'll go ask Brian McLeod, you know, but if I want a, you know, if I want an answer uh, that's more about PPC or something like that, I'll go to somebody else who's, you know, got a lot of experience in that. So, and that's the way that the copywriting world is specialized too, because if, it, you know, when people say who's a good copywriter to follow, it's really, the, you know, start looking at the top copywriters in that niche. Right, right. You know, my, I, I maintain that my dad's probably the greatest copywriter who ever lived, but it's in a way that you can't replicate now because you want to go up against certain people who are doing so good in finance and they've researched that market and they've been selling to it for 20 years. That's a hard lift. You know, that's a big learning curve. And then you want to pop over and do it in diet. And then you want to pop over and do it in, you know, in self-help or you want to pop over and do it in entertainment or, you know, right. you know, fitness or whatever those things. You're up right. against very highly specialized things. So, you know, what I find is best is, you know, you want to learn about podcasts, go talk to Jeremy. He's got a podcast. He's doing it. He's going to know, you know, 
a lot more than one guy pretending to be a guru, a general guru and all. Right. So, Bon, you mentioned a few things, which I don't want to pass over. One, you mentioned prison. Two, you mentioned Russian mob. <laughs> okay. Which, which one do you want to tell me about first? Um, well, I'll tell you. Well, I, I didn't go to prison. <laughs> like I said, I learned from other people's mistakes. No, my father went to prison. In fact, um, he's um, in the story. I just finished explain, uh, writing down sort of the story of how that had happened. What went down was my father made a lot of money very early, so he didn't know how to manage money. And so he would make money, blow it. I mean, just waste it like you wouldn't believe. I saw him spend 200 I wrote the checks for it, too. I saw him spend $250,000 refurbishing his 19-footer, oh, like 25-foot houseboat three times, just switching it from linoleum back to wood and back to linoleum and all the, sinking it three times, all this crazy stuff. He just blew his money. And it wasn't until I was a lot older I realized he was addicted to making it. And he had to make it from the, the experience he wanted was making a million dollar promotion when he desperately needed it. Just like, you know, if you're a gambler, the wind go, set, walking in and just putting down a bet in that first win, that's nothing. The, the rush comes from I'm down and out <laughs> on my last chips and I get a, you know, a royal flush and clean the house out. That's, you know, that's where the big rush for my father was. Mm -hmm. And so he would go, you know, he would do this. And the one time he was on the downswing and he was just breaking through with a promotion. And it was a direct mail piece. And he talked to a list broker who said, you know, I got a giant big list that you should mail. And it's fantastic. He said, okay, well, give me some test names. And he sent him a, what was a merge purge list. And what that meant was the list broker would take that list and compare it to other people who bought a similar product. So let's suppose it's a um, copywriting product. So what he would do is take this list of buyers and compare that with all these other lists of people who bought copywriting products and purge out just the names of who bought everything that was sent to them as an offer. So, mm. it's, a, so it's a super responsive list, right? My dad mails that test out and goes, wow, that's super responsive. We can make a lot of money. Let's take all of our money and go buy this big list. They did, right? The big list failed because the names aren't nearly as hot as he was thinking that they were. So all of this money is all tied up and he now can't afford to fulfill orders. Now, despite this long history of making products, filling orders and running ads and everything, he ends into this management nightmare, which is not actually against the law unless you intend on going and doing this. You run an ad, you don't ever plan on making the product or whatever. So this caused a few complaints. And the postal inspectors cruise by my dad's house out at the beach, which he's renting, but the, you know, it looks like he owns this big multi-million dollar house. Assume that you know, he's just dirty as can be. You know, there's so much smoke, there's gotta be a monster bonfire. And they indicted him. And wow. in and there's and there was a long history of the trial. So my dad actually got convicted of something he did not commit. But the day he walked in there, he said, you know, and he told me this right even right before he did. He said, I'm just accepting this as my way of cleaning the slate for all the things I actually did do, like drinking and driving and, you know, other stuff that he knew that he had done wrong. And when he came out, he came out lean, mean, fighting machine and with a completely clear conscience because, you know, he had already paid for whatever debt, you know, he may have owed society, even mm -hmm. though he, was, he really wasn't. And so he spent, uh, even though he wasn't, guilty of that particular crime and i'm not pretending my father's a saint nobody who knows him will <laughs> but he definitely will is not this you know hate first of all he's not that stupid you know <laughs> i mean how do you run an ad in a business in your own name right you know <laughs> you know postal authorities and everybody's got your address right where you are you don't move or anything i mean the, the whole idea that he was going to do this would have assumed his iq was like eight <laughs> you know it was it was actually pretty bad but anyway while he was in prison he sat down and started writing the, what became eventually the format or the uh, for the entire like new online newsletter industry because what he did was he started writing letters to me teaching me the business and they were a blueprint for his online newsletter and a few of those newsletters put together made his book how to make max money in minimum time then what he did was he, so he started his newsletter off of the blueprints of those le of the the barn letters and then he took it online for free, right? And then boom, everybody, you know, started realizing, you know, he was the first fountain of true information on copywriting and marketing and everybody ate it up. 
So then um, he came in, uh, ex excuse me, he then later said, you know, I wrote, th this is all based on, you know, born letters I wrote to my son a long time ago. And they're raw and they're uncensored and they're from prison. So you know that he's not, you know, mincing words or anything. And he asked my permission because, you know, he asked me if I would, you know, they were my letters. And he right. said, sure. And I said, okay, I'll let you do it. Um, and he republished them and they became like a cult classic. Right. And then I re recently republished them on Kindle and added the updates to explain how this stuff applies to, uh, you know, it, the digital age and, you know, technology, even though that's advanced and updated some of the resources and everything. But so that was that be, that's the call. That's the Boron letters. And you, you can check them out on Kindle. They were they're wildly popular. I mean, they they're still wildly popular, oh, but sure. And they, they're, they're read and reread over and over again. But I was there through that whole process. You want an interesting fact about me? A few people know I used to smuggle my dad's contraband into prison for him. <laughs> what was the contraband? He, he, uh, he, used, he couldn't sleep well. He used like this vitamin herbal supplement called L-tryptophan. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You hear about it from turkeys or whatever. Well, they had like an herbal pill supplement stuff that was made in Canada or whatever, but you could get it at the vitamin store. But because it was a capsule, it was banned on the, on the, it was contraband to go into prison. Well, my dad's job in prison was to rake the, uh, the visitor's yard. Right. And so I, he told me, go, go, get the L-tryptophan, put it in a soft baggie and then just bring it neck on your next visit. And I always say, it's, you know, really strange father-son dynamic when you can ask your 16-year-old kid to smuggle something into prison for you. And he says yes without batting an eye. And so I, I show up, and he goes, okay, we're at the table. He goes, you feel underneath the table? I said, yeah. He says, feel that pipe? Because these were fiberglass picnic tables, and, they you know, they have pipe tubing for their frames. I go, yeah. And he goes, that's your mailbox. So I'd slip it in there. And then he would go back, get searched, and he would retrieve it when he came back to rake the yard the next day. And so, you know, that, that was it. So it wasn't, no, I wasn't sm smuggling him a shiv or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Well, actually, my father-in-law's in that movie. That's funny. In Shawshank Redemption? Yeah. My oh, father in law's an actor. He was on The Sopranos and stuff. So I, my, my kids actually have two pretty famous grandfathers. Nice. <laughs> so the Russian mob. Well... One day I got a phone call, and it was from the police department. You know, my heart starts to beat. I'm like, what's going on, right? And they go, yeah, well, we just want to know if this is your banking info, and I'm talking to the guy, and he says, listen, I you know, can't talk about too much details. Well, it's a case that you've heard about in the news recently and so forth. And this is what had happened. There were this group of guys who were supposed to be Russian mob, from the Russian mob or affiliated, and they were up at a local lake here in California. Not only, I mean, I don't mean local like in 15 minutes away. It's somewhere around here. And what they were doing, and I'd read the story about it, is they were kidnapping people and then having their relatives go siphon cash out of their, their, the bank accounts that they had. And they had their bank info to know how much money that they had. And then they would get the ransom, and then they were killing the people and dumping their bodies in the lake. Well, the police, the police had called, and they because they were part of the um, cleanup crew that was working with the FBI when these guys just got busted. And they were going through the paperwork, and they were calling me because they had my paperwork. And I actually had more money in that account sitting there than the ransoms that they were getting. You know, so I was definitely on their their target list. Wow. And I like to think that it was probably the seventeen thousand dollars in guns I bought that year that may have dissuaded them and said, let's pick a softer target. <laughs> but I don't know. It could have just been dumb luck. And the FBI got to them before they got to me. Um, but I definitely the other thing that was also helpful is, you know, I don't put, you know, my home address on you know my banking and you know I try and compartmentalize my life based on the same principles of seeing what happened with my dad because he, we had a home invasion robbery so when I first started making money I didn't go out and buy a Porsche and I didn't go and you know rub it in my friends faces or anything and you know anything near the level of what my dad was doing uh, but here I was possibly getting targeted just because somebody was had banking info Wow. And so I learned, don't do that. So you start putting your money in stocks and, you know, and things that, you know, people realize they just can't get it. You know, if your mm. money's in your house, you know, what are you going to do? Kidnap somebody and say, okay, you know, go get into escrow. <laughs> so that's what, you know, I learned a lot of lessons from watching my dad over the years. Yeah. So I want to ask about some of those lessons you learned from your dad, but I have to ask, so what do you do with $17,000 worth of guns? 
Oh, I was a um, I was a gun nut for a while. I was just collected, and I had a large number. And I actually would go out shooting all the time. And ammo is very expensive uh, when you're shooting rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds. And then when I had my son, everything kind of reversed. Now I'm on that you know selling off my gun collection type of thing, and it's because you know you know he's going to be a teenage boy soon, and. <laughs> You know, I just I don't I don't feel comfortable with that kind of stuff around. But it was more than just it wasn't just you know it was it was guns and it was shooting and it was the trips to go shooting as well. But you know, and, and trust me, you can rack up you can rack up seventeen thousand dollars at the gun store by buying you know <laughs> you don't have to buy that many guns and a lot of ammo to yeah. to rack that kind of money. Yeah. I just that but the funny thing was I bought almost you know I bought a lot then and I don't think I've bought any since then. <laughs> You know, it was at the like, perfect time, apparently, where the Russian mob was looking into your purchase history. But no, I, well, I mean, it would be, it would have been in that info. Yeah. It would have been. I don't know if it had anything to do with anything. Right. To be right. honest with you, like I said, it's something I like to think, you know. But it, but the one thing that else helped more, that was more helpful than that, was just, yeah. you know, compartmentalizing my life and not being an easy target. Yeah. And it's not that I'm, you know, super wealthy and could be should be targeted over my neighbors or anything like that. It's more or less like, you know, I see people sh sharing screen captures of money on their, you know, or pictures of stacks of cash on their Facebook and social media. I'm like, why do you even have that in your house? You know, I mean, you know, it's not really of max benefit to right. you. I mean, I get it. You don't trust banks or something, but, right. you know. So, Bon, you were talking about, obviously, you grew up with your dad, and he was teaching you the ropes. Tell me about when you first started, when you first partnered with him. Well, I partnered with him a lot, but when I first partnered with him, um, I was actually working at Armani, the, the clothing company. And I was trying to do the corporate thing, and I had always grown up in small business, working in the family business. And what happened was I started getting so stressed out because I was worried about getting this done and worried about what somebody else thought and all this other stuff. And I drove myself absolutely insane. And when that finally reached ahead and broke, I decided, you know what, I'm going to do something else. And I went into, um, I called my dad and I was like, hey, I got this idea. And we talked about, um, he talked, actually he shared an idea and I kept on proving his idea. And then he said, you know what, let's go sell it. And I don't want to rehash and confuse everybody about everything. So I'll just say we went off and started selling this info product and selling lots of it. You know, and then we uh, made, a, made a lot of money with it. And then people took the model and came to me and said, you know, what's the model that works really well here? And because I knew the industry really well and I gave them a slightly different slant and helped put together a few deals. And this was on my own. Um, it, you know, after my dad and I had basically, you know, he started going back to copywriting, I was doing something else. And they went off and they gave me a piece of it because I set the whole thing up and gave them the entire layout, the template and everything that, that was the right way to go. And because of that, it went off and, you know, they, you know, I think we pulled in like, I don't know, like six million or three million, something like that. They went off and pulled in like 21 <laughs> million dollars and stuff like that. So it was, um, it, you know, when I, but when I first, t uh, you know, worked with my father as a partner, you know, it wasn't something that was new because it was, I'd grown up working in the family business. When I was going through, through college on breaks, I was there to help with clients and, you know, do, you know, office and doing all of that stuff. But I've always been my dad's sounding board and I've always been, you know, he, he used to predict, use me to predict results. And he'd always say, you know, if I ask Eric Weinstein if he likes this and he and he loves it, I rip it up and throw it away because that, that guy doesn't know. <laughs> and you talk to Eric and he'll admit it. He's like, yeah, I you know had no notes for that, but I did. So his my dad's goal was always to write a piece that Eric hated and I thought was good. <laughs> but um, so when I did the transition and I started working for him. The, the big difference for me or the big shocker was, you know, now I was a vested, you know, vested partner. And so I saw bigger amounts of money coming in and I started to put into place all the stuff that I had already known, but now it had weight to it. So when it comes to, you know, how do you set up your C-Corps and your S-Corps and all of this other stuff, I had known it all. 
right? But now I'm actually putting it into action. And it's yeah. like, you know, when you go, you learn copywriting, but then you go and actually run your first piece of copy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've always had this advantage, you know, in having the Halbert name. So I can open up, do- you know, it opens up doors for me um, in marketing. So one of my favorite accomplishments has always been when I sell or do something that has nothing to do with the family legacy, you know, because it reminds me, oh, I like know what? what I- well, like not even so, copywriting or yeah, like for example, I started that hobby site with my daughter, right? And all of a sudden, I don't know anything about SEO. That's the reason I started it. it was just to learn. It was a learning experimentation. In a little while, I got 136,000 unique visitors a year coming to this site. My daughter's list is getting bigger and bigger. I'm teaching her. She's putting out, you know, and all of this is, you know, all done under Everett Halbert so that nobody can connect it up to me and it's not related to copywriting. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm telling you about it. But the whole point was all of that stuff and getting it to rank in the first page, I eventually got it up to number one. And all of this stuff that I was learning, just to learn the mechanics of, I all of a sudden realized this isn't, you know, the Halbert name. I'm not having to tell people this. I didn't use my name to open up a door, or get an affiliate, right. or, you know, or to, you know, to. I didn't use it as an advantage. The only thing I'm running here is on skill. And there are all these like, you know, like little stories of things that I will do like that that are mean more to me than the money. And like, for example, one of my favorite wins. Uh, was uh, recently a lady sent me back this thank you card and the thank you card is so great because it tell it, it's thanking me for giving her a letter of recommendation and the, what's so great about it she says I gotta say it's because of your job the office manager here said she wanted to hire me just based on your letter alone before even meeting me so coming in with, you know, afterwards was a snap because I wrote this great one page letter of recommendation Um, using all my copywriting skills and I went and did a unique twist in the end and everything because you know as a copywriter you're thinking okay what's what's the prospect thinking as they just read this what's their next question coming in their head you want to get to it before they do it so I'm going on and on about how great this lady is and I know the next question is, is why aren't you hiring her right so I said if I still lived in Florida I would hire her up in a heartbeat and if you think this is hype I'll I'll make you this offer If you hire her for one week and it doesn't work out, I'll pay $100 out of my own pocket. And, and, you know, and I took that whole letter and I read it to a, a really good copywriter, a uh, friend of mine, Sam Markowitz. He wanted me to, to, to he, when he found out about the result, he was like, let me hear the letter. I read it to him. He says, can you send that to me? Because then I don't have to write a recommendation letter ever again right. because it was so perfect. But there was also another time that I, it, this one sounds kind of, um, I don't know if it's uh, politically risque or not. My advice saved a medical marijuana dispensary here in Los Angeles. I was talking to this lady, and this was back in the days when they were getting shut down left and right. Okay, and this is a great copywriting lesson because it shows how marketing works outside of sales, just like the you know the recommendation letter. Yeah. And they were getting shut down by the the sheriffs and the DEA raids, but the state had already said that these people could be out there. And so they you know this, the the lady I talking was talking to, she goes, "I'm just afraid I'm going to get shut down." And I said, "Well, you know, I got an idea on how you could fix that." And, she, and you know what I would do if I was you? And I said, "Look." Who are they shutting down? They're shutting down, the, you know, they've got a, all these people to shut down. They have to make the choice on who to shut down and who not. So who are they not shutting down? The answer is the medical marijuana dispensary with the AIDS patients hobbling up, trying to make their last days on life uh, of life a little bit easier. Who are the ones they want to shut down first? The ones with rap music blasting out the door and kids skateboarding up four times a day to pick up three ounces of dope, <laughs> right? There's an obvious, like, these are the ones. So what I would do if I was you is I would go and start a group of can get a group of cancer survivors together of your patients um, and hopefully breast cancer survivors because everybody knows somebody who went through breast cancer and chemotherapy and they know somebody who like illegally helped them out by getting them some marijuana to get their appetites back and stuff like that. And so people can automatically resonate with a use for medical marijuana that wasn't just stoners wanting to get high, mm-hmm. right? And I said, use that group, give it an acronym like MAD, right? Something easy to remember. Use that group to go do your politicking at City Hall, right? So I see this lady on another day, and she she goes, hey, Bond. She goes, I took your advice, and it worked. 
she goes, I, you know, I couldn't find, you know, get a large enough group of just breast cancer survivors. So I got a group of cancer surviving women. We put in this group and we went and got the, the lady from City Hall, the City Hall Councilwoman to come and visit our shop and go through the place and stuff like that. This is totally, completely random. I'm sitting there working on my computer, and I have the news going on, the th on the, here, and it switches to C, uh, CNB, no, C-SPAN, the boring channel with one, just one stagnant channel thing, and they're playing an L.A. City Council meeting that happens to be discussing the medical marijuana like uh, ban or whatever they're doing. And I hear that same lady, Janice Hahn, get up and say, we're here today to figure out and, and I told my and I told my prospect that it's all about the spirit of the law and the optics. And she turns around and says on TV, she goes, we're here today to figure out how to curb all of these wild dispensaries and allow the few that we some of us have seen and visited ourselves that we know are following the spirit of the law to remain open. And I was like, oh, man, you owe me money. <laughs> It was like a wag the dog moment, which was what, it was, which was why it was so impressionable on me. But the big here was the big thing. I have written headlines and I have written pieces of copy that make money. I put together deals that make a lot of money. I have done. I have had a numerous amount of successes, my fair share of disappointments, and all of those other things. When you see somebody just taking action on your advice and getting success out of it, it is the best feeling, it, and it's what's remarkable. But when it's something that is so, look, you know, this is a marketing, this is, this is Gary Halbert thinking, but it's not applied to, you know, it's not a formula, the seven things you need to know before you shut down your next pharmacy, <laughs> you know, it's not one of those type of situations. It actually shows a core understanding of, look, you don't want to get shut down. Who are the voices that, who do you have to convince not to shut you down? It's the sheriff's department, the DEA and city council. What do they care about? They care about not pissing off the voters who voted this into law. They care about not upset, you know, they, what they don't care about are the 18-year-old stoners, right, skating up to the shop. What, so I just paid attention to what they do care about and what they don't care about. And it's the same thing like, you know, when you're dealing with anything, you just have to shift that kind of focus. And it's the same principles for marketing and human persuasion apply in writing as they do in real life and they apply to everything in which humans in getting humans help another humans help will benefit you whether it's sending you money uh, voting for you taking you know taking an action or something like that and if you can step into that other person's mind and you can understand what their real day is like what their real concern is like you know, for example, I've won a lot of legal battles and people are amazed, even the lawyers I've worked with, because I beat them I, I beat them by saying, okay, that's all good and well, but here's what we're going to do, and then convincing my own attorneys that this is the way we're going to do so. And there are things that, you know, you've got to understand that other people won't consider. Like, first of all, the, one, the first and most important thing a judge cares about, above all else, it's their docket. It's their time. It's that huge pile of paperwork. So you could be as right as rain in the most, you know, but as soon as you come in there with a 30 minute speech that you're going to take up all their time with, <laughs> they shut you out and the eyes glaze over and then you're scrambling to try and make a point and the whole thing falls apart. If you understand what everybody's main concern is, it helps you in human persuasion. And my dad, you know, people talk, come to him for copywriting advice, but he quickly would start transitioning to human psychology. Yeah. And that's what he was teaching you, is to, uh, how to understand that uh, the prospect with an unadulterated, uncensored, and unfiltered yeah. honesty. And yeah. you can do, and you have to do that with yourself too, you know. Because it, one of the biggest mistakes I see all kinds of people doing is writing about themselves in in a way and in an order nobody cares about. Hi, I'm Bon Halber. You know, I went to this. You know, I went and earned my degree here and blah blah. You know. Nobody cares about that. They want to hear how I got a 76% open rate or they want to, you know, they want to know a trick or they want some inside secrets. And you have to be honest with yourself. Look, one of my favorite subject lines I ever wrote was, thank God my dad went to prison, right? And because it was like, if he didn't go to prison, there would be no a writing of this, you know, there'd be no documenting of right. this incredibly uh, unusual type of education I got. Yeah. Right. So this was my way of documenting. So, but that spin and that that, that 
thing is great. But I fully understand that if I told you, you know, the seven hot tricks that I learned for copywriting this year, and I also told you the seven biggest surprising lessons I learned in prison, let's be real about what you really want to hear about first. Right. It's real, It's not even the thing that benefits you. <laughs> it's that dark, seedy side of what was going on. And if you can be that honest about your own self, it's easier to step into that other person's shoes and say, yeah, well, this is a point where I really don't care if you've got a degree. You know, that may come later when I want to hire you or introduce you to my corporate manager <laughs> type of thing. So anyway, I hope that that's a long way. Yes. Answer. No, I like that. Bond. So tell me about the 52 percent open rate story. OK. Um, my, one of my dad's favorite uh, books is the Robert Collier letter book. And my, you know, and so whenever people came to learn from my dad, he would say, you know, learn this, 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 and that. And one of the the first three books he would ever recommend was the Robert Collier letter book, The Boron Letters, and Scientific Advertising by Claude Hopkins. And all three of them are available for free online. You can actually get Claude Hopkins' book from our website for free, um, <clears throat> or really cheap versions because they went into public domain. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but we got uh, the Robert Collier family reached out to us because while one of the versions was in, in was in public domain, another version was not, or at least it's not. You know, one was disputed, and one is definitely not disputed, and it's the newer version. And so, when you're writing copy, you write what I call dream copy. You write as though you can say what you want about the product that's true, and then you take it to your client and you say, "What about this? Can you make true?" Mm -hmm. And then you back off your claims to where you can stand there and legally, not just legally, but stand there face to face, look somebody in the eye, and wholeheartedly mean what you're saying, right? Um, and so, what I did was I wrote this piece of dream copy type of description of the book for Robert Collier Letter Book. And then I called up Joyce Collier and I said, can you, you know, make any of this true? Because one of the things I said was I added, and let me tell you the reasons why you should buy this version over any other. Because I knew people were thinking, why would I buy I this get version it for free. Yeah. or others? And so I said, and I explained my long history of knowing about the Robert Collier letter book. And that, you know, the, and I explained, I weaved a very cool story about my dad used to send me out. And he tasked me with finding these things. And he tasked other people and other assistants with finding them. But he used to send me literally to, when it was out of print, to go to libraries and find copies, take them, and then pay the fine and give them, you know, pay them for the book two or three times, whatever it was, because he just because they didn't recognize the value or know what they had. My dad wanted the book. Anyway, so I explained all the value of how I knew all of this about the Robert Collier letter book and then how she has added this extra section. She not only did she add an extra section, she had an extra section written by Robert Collier talking about how a story with a corrupt uh, attorney general drove him into politics. And it was really fascinating, right? So I wrote the, uh, so I wrote up the description and then I sat down to write an email. And I, you know, subject lines, you want to look curiosity and benefit and you want to know your target. Well, I go to this list and I wouldn't say it was dead by any means, but it was uh, generated over years. And we have several lists, and this is just one with well over 10,000 names on it. I'm not exactly sure of the number, but I mean, it's thousands and thousands because sometimes you hear about an opening rate and it's 500 names, <laughs> right? And that, of course, would, would skew the results. The names are not scrubbed. There was no fancy doing anything. And I got a 52% open rate, and I did it with the subject line, the holy trinity of copywriting books, okay? So there's a specific, specificity is three, right? The curiosity is, you know, I want to know, is his three the same as my three? And then in there, I have the books listed, and I put in my arguments, and I even put the links to where you can go get the free versions and stuff like that. All three of those books shot into the top four spots of Amazon's paid section for um, for copywriting for a couple of days. So, uh, you know, I was like, I'm, like, I'm going to start calling myself the Oprah of copywriting books, but <laughs> the... Uh, and, um, but so it was the click through rate followed through. So, what you know, because you can get a high open rate and fool people into opening your thing, but how many follow through and buy? How do you do it and make it, um, you know, the continuity so good that people don't feel like you tricked them into opening and they follow through, like what you want? They're still, you know, you still touched on the nerve and they, they buy, right. they click through, they take the action that you want. Yeah. And so, you know, doing that, I was I, I was actually stunned myself. I didn't expect all three of them to make it. I, you know, I was hoping the three of them would make it in the top 20, not in the top four. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. 
So what about, what do you tell your daughter? Because you said your daughter is a 40% open rate. What what uh, teachings do you do you have her do? Well, the uh, first thing I did was in reverse, is I started teaching. I said this, I show her subject lines. I said, why did this one get a bigger one than that one? And she started understanding a broader appeal, you know, and she started understanding the concept of what, I, what I'm explaining to you, spe- being specific, but leaving so, so much curiosity dangling that you can't avoid it. And so I taught her to do that. And so, and so what she would do for her weekly email is go through all the events or whatever she could highlight. And she would try and find something that would that would resonate with a di- each category of people. Like so, if one weekend she might uh, list a car show, excuse me, for the guys, um, a wardrobe show at Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandise for the ladies, and a free puppet show for the kids, or something like that. And she would, um, and so I would teach her the how to write the subject lines, and how to do it with. Um, uh, try and be as ma- say the most amazing thing you can without giving it away, right? Making people think I've already know what this is, and being as specific as possible. So I teach you to write things like you know we just added 28 new free events. Actually, no, it was like we had just added like 78 new free events for the week. You know, to the calendars for the week. And that makes everybody who's not even interested wondering, really, you got 78 free events in LA? Let me over the next week. Let me go see what it is. And um, I would teach her just things like that. So she was sitting there writing the subject lines on her own. And basically by reverse engineering and teaching her the psychology right. of the reason of what I was doing, ushered her into doing it. And so actually we call her the princess of print. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to get her to do a, her own little product, um, which shows people breaking down and explaining how her own email works. Because you know it, it's, you know, a slightly watered down version of mine. But people, people take away. You know, this. I was thinking of doing the course. You know, how to teach your 13 year old to be an online marketer and make more money than you do. You know, because that's got a lot of broad appeal for a lot of people. Right. But they they assume that you know if she can do it, I can do it. Exactly. So, what are some of your other favorite subject lines, Bond? Oh, um, that's a hard one off the top of my head. Um. There's a lot of them, but the, the it, you know what, actually, the 73 things, um, they're not actually, I don't find, I find the subject line comes quite easily um, uh, for me because it comes out of the hook that I found for the whole story. Right. And, um, and and it's not, uh, the, what's effective, it's not that I, I'm never trying to be super clever and witty and impress people with the way I write. Sometimes... I'll, you know, like when I did the um, "Thank God Gary went to prison" stuff, right. it I really liked it because it was clever and it tied in, and it was it was great in that way. But stuff that really works are things like you know tw- 25, 24 hours only, and there's not and you know no reminders, um, you know heavily curiosity benefit laden one. And I started teaching people tricks on how to model actual news stories and find the right sources and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I'd have people that, you know, start using the stuff and come back and triple their open rates from 10 to 30% with a list of 30,000 names. And in fact, that was the, that's one story I really like. There's this guy who did that and he goes, he, and he calls me and he says, and then, and he didn't really know me at the time or that I was so approachable. And he, he calls me and he goes, I did this thing. <clears throat> and I jumped my open rate by 30% or 300% that Bond taught me. And then I saw another friend of mine send me this great killer subject line. And I opened it and I said, me, and I called my friend and said, man, that was great. And he says, yeah, I got this product that it, where Bond Halper is teaching me how to do this. <laughs> and it was the greatest like story because these two guys were jumping off and doing it. And what I was doing was just modeling the dark underbelly. You know, it's, um, you know, because my favorite subject lines and headlines are actually not mine. They're actually, you know, creative, clever ones that, you know, some, it's like my dad's, um, you know, seven things you need to know before you hire your next product photographer is a headline I gave somebody that's very good, but it's not my favorite. My favorite are those, you know, uh, it, it, so I want, I want to separate favorite from affected. Got it. Right. Okay. Um, you know, but a lot of the times those favorites are affected. You know, like the the other one, I could pull up a list of them and tell you what I've been sending to people, but it's it's mostly about um, 
it's 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 subject lines for me when I write them. It's mostly when you can get the continuity going from subject line all the way through to the offer, and people don't feel like you veered course that you're coming back. It's like comedy coming back around to your original statement, and you want to put in a little seedy dark side of stuff, you know. So it's not like you know things you learned. It's your confessions. Yeah. These are you know this is what people like specificity. I throw numbers and everything, you know. Um, so if somebody sends me their thing and says, you know. 17 great email tricks i'll turn it into 17 email tricks you need to know for 2015 you know and then boom the specificity you know all that so i it's curiosity specificity and dark yeah. side those yeah. are the three elements i put into all of them um god it's hard for me to think of one off the top no of my i like head. hearing your psychology behind it it's, it's helpful because then you know obviously all the content of the email is gonna you know be applicable to the subject so kind of knowing that psychology can help anyone put together you know whatever that subject is like for this one when you said that i'm like but well, you have to include like russian mob or something so, you know yeah <laughs> the well no how i was targeted by the russian mob right. you know they they come out and the thing is my story doesn't change that you know when i say thank god my dad went to prison you don't turn around and go oh that was a cheap opening you're like yeah that makes sense right. you really there would be no proof that you were being taught this at 15 if he didn't you know write those letters to you yeah yeah you know and, and those letters came after i had a few years of education <laughs> you know they they were signed kind of in the middle of the childhood For experience sure. but i want to ask you about some of the successful campaigns some of the ones that didn't do as well do you have more time or right at that hour point or... i got some more time okay um yeah, I'm uh, wanting to hear more and more stories. So I have to catch myself. Um, but <laughs> the the successful campaigns. What were some of the other ones that were successful, and why were they so effective when you're working with your dad? Oh well, actually, the, let me tell you the key is uh, you know instead of going through this campaign, I mean I could list all my dads and I could even list mine. Um, like the the real key to being a big to, there's it's like baseball. You can go out there and bunt all day long and maybe make it to first base and, you know, outrun the ball and, you know, get your get your wins and do, do that the hard way. And, you know, that's kind of like, you know, just starting off on your own and promoting things on forums and spreading an affiliate link here and there and stuff like that. It's very hard work. It's very labor intensive. But then when you start to play ball for real and you want to hit homers, okay, you start, you know, sliding to get, you know, just hit the ball and then just trying to hit a grounder and then just working your way up to homers. And then you got the guys who play the percentages. And then you've got the guys like my dad who are like Babe Ruth, which means that they swing for the fences. Some of them bomb. Right. Some of them go wild. Right. And nobody has ever been able to predict accurately this is the one that's going to go really wild. It's never really happened. The truth is marketing is about experimenting. It's about throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks. And, you know, my dad did that a lot. So he wasn't afraid to fail. Um, I don't have to do it nearly as much because I have a built-in audience <laughs> to do it. Um, but the it's 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 th it's trying stuff that really works well for me. So I'll give you one of my dad's and one of mine. Yeah. Um, in my dad's campaigns, um, you know, the one that failed really bad was a radio spot he did for weight loss, in which he used comedy and started insulting his prospects. You know, talking about making fat jokes basically to a weight loss audience. And they're not going to, you know, that was obviously a huge mistake. You know, he's offending his audience. He's offending people who aren't even in his audience, right? You know, he's offending anybody who has, you know, a friend that's overweight and stuff like that. And even though he tried humor and everything, it just totally bombed to the point where he got zero orders. Now, I myself, knock on wood, have never written anything that got zero response. If my job was to get the phone to ring, I've never not made it ring. If my job was to make a sale, I've never not made a sale. I have made things that, oh, this wasn't real, you know, this, we could have done something more profitable, this was disappointing, don't, don't get me wrong, <laughs> I do fail, but this was one where it was like chirps, you know, and it was real, because most of the time, you, you know, you put, send out some mailing, and you get chirps, and it's silence, and it's because something went wrong, and you go to the post office and find your mail was dumped in the dumpster, or you find out you had the wrong phone number was printed on it, and somehow that got out, or whatever. This one was just a, an unmitigated disaster. But he experimented, and he was playing, and he was playing with radio, uh, a medium he wasn't familiar with. Um, the big successes or th for him were things like, I, my favorite is probably the Tovo campaign. 
you know, Tova, um, wife of famous movie star, swears under oath her new perfume is not does not contain an illegal sexual stimulant. It was just such a creative, you know, great hook. And I remember walking around that launch because nobody knew who I was. I was just a kid at the time, and I was hanging out, listening to people who were walked hanging. I was right behind people who were hanging around this giant poster board of the ad itself that my dad had um, put in the lobby and they were talking about the ad and how brilliant it was and they were talking about which isn't something that he would have been proud of he wants them to talk about but they were talking about the perfume and the offer and the launch and this is cool and everything and it just was wildly successful he filled up they the fire department had to come in and shut it down or at least stop letting people in because they had filled the entire century city plaza Wow. hotel ballroom i mean it was just a massive amount of people it was wildly more successful than you thought it would be and you never know how something's going to work like that you try things yeah. so like one of my favorite campaigns i did was actually a digital you know i do a lot of email copywriting of our stuff and if you want to see any a lot of stuff i write just pop on the letter but i like it when you try new interesting angles and so when i published the boron letters and i updated them I knew they were available for free, so I had to do something to promote them and get some traction. And my goal, you know, and I wanted that number one status, and I wanted that number one status for a while. And the reason I did is I knew that um, if I was Amazon, the, the books that I would be more likely to highlight in a category were ones that stayed at the number one position, had good reviews, and stayed there the longest, right? So I'm trying to do all of those things, get a good reviews, make sure it stays there longest, you know, so forth. So one of the things that I did was I told everybody, um, you know, I, I, I spaced it out. I drove it to our, tra you know, made the big announcement to our list and kept pushing one list after another until it hit number one. And then I would wait for it to slack off. And then I would announce a webinar I was going to give away as a bonus for anybody who sent in a copy of their receipt. And then it would jump back up to number one. I'd wait for it to slack off a bit. And then I would announce the replay, right? And so it jump, so it would pop up to number one again. And every time it would slip back, I would go forward. Well, I did two things in that process that I thought were really cool. One, I had been letting it sit and languish for a while. And I told everybody, everybody who holds, I'm going to throw a special webinar on how, what I learned making a on publishing a number one bestseller on Amazon to everybody who goes onto social media and holds up a picture of the book of themselves holding the book and it can be any copy as long as you paid for it, it can be your Kindle your iPhone or anything like that so the next day every, you know people who everybody if you're into copywriting you don't have nobody who's a friend into copywriting on your Facebook right you have few people who are interested in it so the next morning there's a lot of people who wake up and see a bunch of their friends holding this book and smiling going this is a great book on copywriting one of my favorites and so forth that social interaction makes it irresistible not to know about it I mean how many times did I go see a chick flick just because everybody said it was so great you have to see it right. you know and not even chick flicks like Schindler's List I would never go, you know you tell me the premise of that movie I'd be like no You'd I don't be depressed. Pay. I don't pay for depression. I don't. I don't pay to cry or any of that. But I have to go see it just because, every, you know, it's the social thing. Anyway, so everybody sees that. The book shoots right back up to number one. Some people are buying it just to get in the, the thing. But most of them are buying it because of the social media aspect of it. And then the next thing I did was I told everybody who bought my book. I said, go buy John Carlton's book, right? And this doesn't seem to have any value on the front end of it, but it does. Because now the algorithm is telling everybody that buys John Carlton's book that, that these are also people who bought the Boron letters. So what happens now is people go to buy John Carlton's book and they see two more books for free shipping and they look down below and the people who bought this book happen to like what book? The Boron letters. And I kept the I kept the, the book up there in the top spot for so long that when you buy John Carlton's book, you will get an email promoting the Boron letters from Amazon. Really? <laughs> yes. Oh, that's you pretty also, genius. Yeah. You will also get an email from Amazon promoting the Robert Collier letter book. I mean, I mean, uh, people uh, born letters to people who bought the Robert Collier letter book, and scientific advertising. So, so when I did the, these are the holy trinity of copywriting books. I'm not just doing them a big favor by you know promoting and giving them a free plug. I'm giving myself a huge free plug. And the funny and that strategy has worked. I didn't see the sales decline from the barn letters. They you know, and it's and and they're doing all this promoting and stuff for me. And so it was it's little things like that. And it, it, again, 
it's you want something from somebody or some organization, figure it out. With SEO, I don't know anything about SEO. You know, I mean, I just went in and built the site and I figured, you know what, I'll tag these with what they really are. The pictures will describe, the titles will describe what's really in the picture. My site really is about three things to do in LA, three things to do in Los Angeles. So I just did everything the way a realistic person would be. I became what Google was looking for. So Panda, you know, the Panda update, boom, I go up, everybody else goes down. You know, every update I saw my site go up until I stopped, you know, refreshing and paying a lot of attention to making it current. But the whole, th the whole point was I understood what Google wanted. I became what they wanted to promote so that they would promote me. I understood what Amazon wanted, so I became what they wanted to promote me. Right. You know, I understood what a lot of these guys would want. So <laughs> I would get them, you know, I, I would get it so I could help get their promotion I mean, or help get them. And it's, you know, you pull out all the stops. You want your marketing, your persuasion. You do what you can to get what you want to get, right? And there's a lot of people who you don't know who you're talking to. You don't know if you're talking to the person who says, yeah, sure, I'd love to. Or you don't know if you're talking to the person who's like, well, I don't know, what's he want? Maybe I, what's in it for me? Or you're talking to the person, you know, you don't know the level of interest they are. So you pull out all the stops in advance. And like, for example, with this particular one, um, you know, I got Sugarman first. And the next guy I got was, I, you know, wanted a commitment from Jay Abraham. So my brother says, you know, gets Jay Abraham to say, yeah, he's interested or willing to do it. Before Jay Abraham could do anything, I went and told the whole world, hey, I got Joe Sugarman and Jay Abraham on board. Because I want to be in a project with Jay Abraham and Joe Sugarman. Who doesn't, right? <laughs> so... And I want to be part of, you know, the immortalization of the Gary Halbert legacy. Who doesn't? You know, so I'm creating a situation that, yes, they're doing it because they want, they love my father and they're kind people. And they really, really are. But I'm also making, I'm making, I'm doing everything. You pull out all the stops so they don't. To make them want to do it. Right. You know, it's about, it's not about manipulating people into doing what you want. It's about making them want to do what you want to do and being happy about it afterwards, too. Yeah. You know, it's all the way through. Yeah, yeah. Von, so what um, are the big mistakes people do make that you see with their hooks and their, their email copy? Um, well, with their email copy, the first thing they do is they don't understand the, the link structure. They give it away in the subject line and they don't get people to open the, the, the email, right? Or they don't understand the continuity of the thought process that needs to, you know, of the prospect going from the, the beginning, you know, the subject line, or even actually even better yet, how the names were generated. You know, I'm one of the first people to actually, you know, systematically target primary email addresses and recognize that, you know, all you people are worrying about a spam filter before you're even worried about, you know, whether you got a spam email address. And, you know, a, a quick note on that. You know, we all have a secondary spam email address. And some guy tells you, hey, look, I've got the system that's going to teach you how to explode your podcast, you know, your um, traffic. And you say, well, I want to know that. And it says, oh, but I won't tell you unless you give me an email address. And you're like, you know, I'm not stupid. I got a fake email address for you, right? You know, here it is. And the right. guy goes, aha, but I'm smarter than you. You got to click a confirmation link. You're like, well, that doesn't make you smarter than me. I'm just going to my spam email address and I go into and I look up the, you know, the emails. There's 500 emails since the last time you've been there. You scroll right to the top and you get that guy's PDF or the access to whatever it is. And one of two things happens. He either A, delivered and you're off trying and experimenting his stuff, leaving his, leaving your email address on his list in a, you know, where you're never going to get it. Or B, he doesn't give you what you want. You're off to the internet finding something else out, right? But later on that day, you see that there's 50 emails in your spam email folder in your primary email address. Do you just delete it? No. You scan it to make sure that grandma didn't slip through the cracks. You scan it to make sure that that receipt you were looking for didn't go through because this is your primary email address. You just don't give it out. So you scan those, those things real quick to see if there's any emails or something from somebody you don't know. And then you, before you delete it. So the, the, the lesson here is it's better for your emails to show up in the spam box of a primary email address than to show up in the primary box of a spam email address. Right. Worry getting, about getting a primary email address before you worry about getting through a spam filter. Yeah. Oh, hold. 
Hold on, I think I have to let my daughter in. <laughs> All right, let's get her to talk about her open race. <laughs> For those of you listening to audio, Bond is stepping away for a second. Sorry about that. No worries. So there's so many questions, but we've going, been going a long time now. Um, I want to hear about a, a low point for you and a proud moment for you personally. You know, professionally, but... You know, not necessarily your dad, but just you. Oh, no. Um, I have no problem giving you my own or my father's. Um, my dad's low point was obviously when he went to prison. Yeah. <laughs> not, a, not a good point. Yeah. No, that, 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 that tends to be a low marker for a lot of people. Um, I would say, you know, the low point for me was right after my dad passed away, I went into a pretty good depression, well. you know, which is to be expected. And, you know, a lot of people didn't realize or understand that, you know, I lost a lot more than just my father, you know, I mean, and at that point, we, he wasn't a partner of mine. Actually, I was doing better than he was. But the, you know, what I'd lost was a mentor, somebody, a guy, you know, I spent so much time not under, you know, it's talking about marketing with him. I mean, my dad didn't talk about sports or anything else. He, that was his hobby as well as his business. Yeah. And it was something that we were all very interested in. So when he passed away, I got into this depression, and then it turned into a funk. And I didn't know why it was a funk until one day I said, you know, I want to talk marketing with somebody. I've never talked about marketing with anybody because they, you know, you know, people come to me and say, hey, can I talk to you about marketing? I'm like, no, I got a phone call with my dad later. I get enough of this, right? So I didn't realize how much I would miss that. Hmm. And so I went out to a meetup group. And uh, which was for like copywriting or direct marketing, and it was cool. it was interesting because the person said you know had people filling out name tags with, and I just put my first name you know which is unique enough being Bond, but I didn't put my last name on it. And I was sitting there talking to this lady who, um, and I said, "What do you do?" She said, "I'm a product photographer." And I said, "How do you get business?" She said, "Well, I send these cute little photographs and um, to businesses, and then I have a girl do follow up calls." And I thought, wow, you know, there's somebody who's taking action and making movements. And, you know, if you can find people willing to make cold calls to anybody, they're, they're going to be the winners in life because they're willing to put in the time and the effort and, you know, make mistakes and all that other stuff. Um, so I was impressed with that. And I said, you know what you should do is you should do the seven things you need to know before you hire your next product photographer. And I said, then tell them and say, Look, having a product photographer is different than a regular photographer. A regular photographer will go frame it, angle it, get you the right exposure, make your thing you know, look vibrant, bright and clear, and so forth. But a good product photographer understands that there's an emotion attached to, what pe to people buying your product. And a good product photographer will create circumstances and backgrounds that capture the emotion that your prospects want to buy. And then I gave her a list of all these different little things to add to the seven reasons. And then, of course, at the end, and you say the um, at the end of it, you say, uh, you know, the, you know, a lot of people have a hard time differentiating. You know, this is where you can go and look, or of course, you can just hire my company. We have specific, you know, our photographers are specifically trained for this, and here's why. And she just like ignored me, right? She turns around, and I'm like, okay, I lost her because again, like I said, people taking action with the advice you give them is a rare thing, right? Mm -hmm. She's actually, I'm like, I lost her. She's not paying attention. She pulls out she's actually got a pen she, she's starting to write this stuff down and i'm like okay i didn't and um she turns to me she goes you know you're pretty good at this <laughs> not no, no clue as to who i was or my background and pretty soon somebody else came around from the crowd because a bunch of people started paying attention to what advice i was giving based just on the advice and somebody came around eventually and said you wouldn't by chance be bond halbert would you and i was like yeah yeah <laughs> but that um that funk that i was in was really detrimental to my business. I basically just stopped everything because I'm I the one thing that a lot of people don't know about my father or me is we're not motivated by money the way that most marketers are. I get a huge kick off of little wins, you know, the, and experimenting and doing something neat. I get, you know, yesterday was the anniversary of the Gary Halbert letter. The very 28 wow. years ago yesterday, That's my amazing. dad sat down and wrote the very first one. Wow. So I took this copy, this printed copy of the first letter, right? 
And I put it on Facebook and I said, anybody who shares this, and I'd link to the actual letter online that you can read, it's to drive traffic to the Gary Halbert letter. I said, anybody who shares this is automatically entered in a, into a drawing to win this. <laughs> and, you know, so when I woke up this morning and saw 65 people had shared it, <laughs> I would, you know, I'm like, yay, it's things like that that make you go, you know, that's cool. When I write stuff that is standard stuff that works, you know, and, and stuff like that, it's not as fun as the experimenting. It's this, you know, my dad was, I heard somebody else describe it and they were really good, really accurate. My dad was a social scientist of sorts. And I'm sort of the same way that, you know, it's the little experimentation and tinkering that does really well. Because I'll tinker and do something and just let it go because yeah. it worked and all that. And I'm just not a good business manager. I'm much better at con conceptualizing marketing plans, ideas, hooks, offers, that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, um, you know, and, and, that, and that comes a lot easier for me than most. Yeah. So, so what has been the proudest moment for you? Um, you know, I, I'd say, I would say actually, believe it or not, it's in relation to the audio series. Um, one of the things that happened when we did the audio series is, it, this was important to me posterity-wise, so, um, when, you know, I, when I know something's going to be around for years and years to come, I want to put a little more time and effort into it. It's like, you know, I don't go and, uh, if I go to a wedding and I know there's family photographs that are going to be up on the walls and they're taking pictures of me, that's when I'll cut my hair and get a nice, you know, put on a suit and tie or whatever, you know, look, do, do something to look a little bit better. Um, so I didn't want this to just go out and be a hit or miss thing. Right. So I took my commentary and I took it to a mastermind group um, with John Carlton's mastermind group. And I started reading it aloud to them. And I didn't think that I wasn't sure that I was going to go with the commentary I had until I saw somebody taking notes on it saying, okay, there's good stuff here that I need to know and tricks and tips and strategies and he, stuff he's showing me. Yeah. So that's when I knew it was good. But and I knew the content was good, but then John Carlton turned to me, or turned at the end, he's like, you know, I really can't tell the difference between when you spe speak and when your dad, you know, when it's your dad. He's yeah. like, you know, that's how much you sound like him. And I had heard other people say that to me. Mark Victor Hansen said it to me once, but Lasers, you know, they're on the phone with me and they're like, wow, you sound just like your dad in the way that I talk to them, not in the way that I sound. Right. Um, but when, when he said that, it was a very, that, that stood out as a proud moment. Um, you know, it's the teaching of other people and their successes, you know, the, you know, getting the 52% open rate on a list with thousands and having a Weber and get response that, you know, I've been in, in talking with their texts. I'm like, can you do me a favor and look at my, e you know, cause I didn't know. I'm like, you know, to me, it's like, you know, you hear 52% as a newbie. You're like, that's only half your list. Why, why are you having problems? <laughs> you know? And that's how I ended up calling these guys because I got like, and one of them was like a 76% open rate on a list of like 3,000 names. This is when I'm tinkering. And I'm like, how do these compare with others? They're like, oh, no, you're doing really good. <laughs> and, you know, but they still, it is those, it is those, it's the successes of people that you teach and show stuff to that makes you feel even better than when you cash in a big check. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, or, you know, you sit back and, you know, make $30,000 in a week and you've worked like two hours, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, and everybody's, everybody thinks, what are you kidding me? That would be the greatest thing of all. I'm telling you, it's, it's, you know, you get over one level, you get to another level, you get to another level, but the one that never gets old is, you know, I took your advice and helping it other like people. Charm. Yeah. Helping yeah. other people. Bon. One last question before we end. I really appreciate your time with this. Hugely invaluable insights. Tell me, um, before I ask the last question, where can people find the information on the boron letters? On, where do you want to send people? Okay, well, I'm going to give you, uh, basically, you know, boron letters and the Gary Halbert letters all-star audio series can be found on Amazon and iTunes. But you can find... Everything that my brother and I do that's really very Gary Halbert centric is going to be on one of two sites. One is called The Gary Halbert Letter, okay, spelled with the B as in boy. Um, and uh, so it's GaryHalbertLetter.com and Halbertizing with an S. We have it with the S and the Z, but Halbertizing.com is where we, if we augment my dad's material, 
So if we um, if we add to it or mm. we break down my dad's ad or anything, that's where we send people. So we can leave all those purists that love the Gary Howard letter the way it is and the way it was. We can just if it's got to be 100% Gary, Gary, Gary to be on that site. If it's augmented and you know basically about the Halbert family institution of training people to be copywriters and everything, it's on Halbertizing. Now, I personally started my own blog, so I can just say whatever I want without having to get anybody's permission, and that, of course, is at bondhalbert.com. Okay. But, you know, the, the, the site that's going to give you the most bang for the buck is the Gary Halbert letter, and halbertizing is where you're going to find us taking it to the next level. That's where you find the explanation behind the coat of arms letter. That's where you're going to, that's where you find the copy, you know, Gary Halbert copywriting seminar. You know, and stuff that anything that we feel like we need to update. So, yeah. I, I I call that the good stuff. Yeah, so. <laughs> we'll link all that up. We'll link all that up in the in the post. So my last question is, Bob, what question is important to address about copywriting direct response that we haven't covered that would be important to talk about? Oh, well, there's there's a lot to it, but. I, you know, the one thing that I see that a lot of people don't understand or grasp, when, or at least people who get a hold of me and want to tap my head, is um, they don't understand where the research is, okay? And they don't understand, you know, I, I try to explain that, look, you're writing really, you know, there's the, the, all your power in your copywriting comes from research. It's knowing your customers. You know, the Domino's pizza got big because they understood. These people were sick and tired of not knowing if that pizza came in 15 minutes or 45 minutes. So they started the 30 minutes or it's free program, right? And so it was the power of understanding that. They could have said half hour or it's free, 30 minutes or it's on us. They could have worded that any way they wanted to. It didn't make a difference. It was understanding what they wanted. The Gary Halbert Letter All-Star Audio Series People skip right over the copy and just go and grab it and buy it, like I said, because it's what they wanted. It's I understood what my market wanted. They want to listen to Gary in the car. They want to hear Gary Benzavinga's take on Gary Halbert. And they want to hear John Carlton's stories about Gary Halbert and on and on. So it's understanding your market is all research. That's where all your power is. Yeah. Your talent actually comes from hook and angles. There are certain talents and certain hooks and angles I'll come up with that a lot of people will not come up with for a while. And that, that's where creativity comes involved. But it's not, that's where it's easy to model news and there's tricks to, you know, to doing that, to getting your hook and to getting your angle. But, the, um, but that's where the, the light bulb moment is, the big idea and stuff like that. And that, that's, that's important too. And the refinement, your professionalism comes in the editing process. Newbies will start editing from the beginning and then they go, okay, I found this word. And they'll start again from the beginning. By the time they get to the end, the top has been re-edited 10 times and is smooth as silk, but at the bottom it completely falls apart because it's been looked at once, if at all. Okay, so one, that's a tip. Just do your editing in complete passes, you know, and write in complete passes as well. Um, don't worry about whether or not it's too good or too weak or too strong. You can clean that up in the next pass or the next editing phase. But the part of where you're sitting down and writing the copy is not the, the time-consuming, difficult part. It's where you're making the pitch that you've been walking around in your head making as you go, go to the beach and you've been absorbing all the information of your products. And one of the questions that you've actually asked me before, I think, is one of the ones that gets a lot of people frustrated, which is how do you find that story? You know, right, and, they, yeah. and they basically say, how do you make a story out of it? You don't make a story. You know, you just, um, you know. Uh, yeah, crafting the story is a uh, is a big one. Yeah, you uh, okay? You you find the story and you dig and you dig into the history of it. You dig into the history of the industry, like Bo like Claude Hopkins did for the Schlitz beer ad. You dig into the story and how it was developed. You dig into the developer story. You dig into the failures. You know, sometimes people don't. You know, I'll give an example: the light bulb. You know, when they go, ta-da, here's a light bulb, and everybody's amazed by that. But the value of that goes up when you say, you know, we did the, we made these 1,000 mistakes first. And you explain, you know, so look into the history of the failures that mm. came before it. Look into the history, you know, and I say, ask the who, what, where, when, and how about the product, the industry, the creator, and the business. But then every time they give you an answer, do it again. So if they say, you know, uh, you say, you know, when? When was this business started? Okay, it was started in 1983. 
Why? Why was it started in 1983? You know, oh, I know why, and then that leads to a good story. You dig these stories out of people. You'll have mm -hmm. clients going on for, you know, I have a client uh, now, and, it, you know, the, the issue with his is believability. And then I find out, you know, like a couple of weeks later, he's got a like cert U.S. Circuit Court judge on his list of, you know, of buyers that he can use. And it's like, that's pretty big credibility. You know, I'm not a scammer kind of accolade. But, you know, you dig end up digging these things out of people by asking those questions. And, and then as soon as you get somebody talking, you shut up and let them go and go and go. And your questions are just designed to prod them. So you ask the who, what, where, when, why and how. And then ask that about every answer until you just nauseate. They're nauseated and they're <laughs> sick of hearing from you. And you're just finding all the little details and tidbits out right. because there's all the stuff people don't know that you would find interesting. Mm -hmm. And everything the client thinks is interesting or something that's important to you is rarely of any interest whatsoever to the prospect. You know, I, you know here's where I started and here's how I became interested in, you know, um, in clay pottery. They don't really care how you get interested in clay pottery. They want to know, you know, uh, you know how you came up with this, how you come up with unique designs every other week. They want to know something that's a benefit to them, right. you know. And then you can weave that into the, you know, you can weave the, the, you know, uh, weave the story or weave those benefits into the story that is of interest. And it's it's amazing, but it's you know it's basically basically you want to make yourself a you know a questionnaire that reminds you to ask all these questions to yourself about your own products and services because you forget the interesting story of why you got into the hardware business you forget to tell the fact that you know you're here because you're you know your dad invented this special paint scraping tool that you know was the beginning of it all you know and people find out those little bits of history and those interesting tidbits and they yeah. pass them on you know yeah. and you know they don't tell you that you know um, you know, the first investor in our hot dog stand was, you know, um, was Mel Blanc, <laughs> you know, some, you know, something that's just like, wow, really? <laughs> you know, you didn't tell me that. And thank God, because if everybody knew their stories, copywriters wouldn't have much of a job, <laughs> you know, but you, when you, you know, you got to dig it out of yourself as well, you yeah. know, yeah. and then you go through what I call the so what test, you know, you write your copy and go through it and say, you know, you know, as a prospect, do I really care about this? And look at yourself from the other person's perspective. Yeah. yeah. Bob, th I just want to be the first one to thank you because I am tempted just to keep asking you questions until you're nauseated, but I'm not going to. But I appreciate it. Everyone should check out the sites. I'll link them up. It's been great. You've been fantastic. I appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, and I hope it's of value to somebody. <laughs> thank you, Bob. <laughs>